We've gone from thinking genetics doesn't have any importance to realizing it's the most important、mm-hmm. factor by far. We're talking about half, 50% of the variance of the differences between people in mental health and illness, psych, you know,、um, personality, cognitive abilities. Half of those differences are due to inherited DNA differences. It's a slippery slope, as you're implying. You know, it gets into designer babies. Then, what if I said, as some parents do who do this, I want a kid with a high IQ. You can、yeah. do that, <laughs> and that scares people. The problem with obesity is we evolved in a in a stone age where、um, we have stone age brains in a fast food world. Instead of waiting till someone has a heart attack, you can now predict、mm-hmm. which people are likely to have a heart attack. It's that sort of discomfort around questioning our agency over our own lives, I suppose. And the answer is just as you say: you have less control, agency over your children than you think you do. Your book. Blueprint has shattered a lot of my beliefs about our behavior and where it comes from. So throughout this conversation, I'll be trying to sort of put my worldview together with your help.、Um, so, in your fifty years of research, what was the one single most surprising finding? Yeah, well, I think the basic science of it. You know, when I started in 1970 in graduate school, we were really taught that everything about us psychologically—mental health, personality, cognitive ability—everything is due to the environment. That was just an assumption of the time, and you couldn't even really talk about genetics, in part due to Nazi Germany and eugenics, but also. As a, re- a reaction to that, then people just ignored biology and genetics and thought everything is due to the environment. More specifically, it was due to what your mother did to you in the first few years of life. I mean, textbooks at that time actually said that schizophrenia is caused by what your mother does to you in the first few years of life. So, in that atmosphere, even saying, "Well, isn't it possible genetics is important? It's important for so many biological characteristics and physical characteristics, height." And wait, what about psychological traits? And slowly, then, that research has been building a mountain of evidence saying not only is genetics significant, it's very substantial. You mentioned effect size, and that's a very important concept. It's not just statistical significance. We're talking about half, fifty percent of the variance of the differences between people in mental health and illness, psych, you know,、um, personality, cognitive abilities. Half of those differences are due to inherited DNA differences. So, most surprising finding for me was that we've gone from wondering if genetics has any influence whatsoever on psychology to now recognizing that the challenge is to find anything, any trait in psychology that's reliably measured that does not show significant genetic influence. So, that's been the most surprising thing in my career, and as a result of that evidence. It's only a few loonies who sit, still think there's no genetic influence, but they've really are so much on the sideline now. You can forget about them. And what's even more interesting to me is that this is this understanding has moved into the public realm, which is why I like doing conversations like this because it does have importance for people understanding themselves and their children. And really, larger societal issues as well. It's not just a niche scientific. Sort of finding it really does have broad significance, and especially now with the DNA revolution that I think we'll come on to. So the single most important、um, uh, what discovery or whatever is that we've gone from thinking genetics doesn't have any importance to realizing it's the most important、uh-huh. factor by far, which is why my book is called Blueprint: How DNA Makes Us Who We Are, because genetics doesn't account for everything, but it's So much more substantial in its influence than anything else we know about. So we think parenting is very important. Parenting—it's rare to find anything that explains one or two percent of the variance. Whereas here we're talking about fifty percent of the variance of psychological traits being due to inherited DNA differences. So I'm sure we'll come on to all of that. Yeah, and I think when I was. <laughs> When I was looking、um, at the reaction, for example, to your book, you know, you have faced、uh, some criticism as well,、um, and I think one of the most often sort of brought 
criticism to behavioral genetics is genetic determinism, essentially. Mm -hmm. And that is everywhere in our culture. And other than the leftovers of the 20th century, what do you think drives this perhaps mental inflexibility to look Mm -hmm. at the issues that we are all trying to grapple with just through a different lens? Yeah, well, very good question. That um, I know the answer to that question for sure. That is, we learn about genetics from Mendel, you know, who in the mid 1800s studied characteristics of pea plants, and they were single gene mutations. That is, a mutation in a single gene caused if you were a pea plant, your seeds would be wrinkled if you had this mutation. Otherwise, they'd be normal and smooth. So he studied seven characteristics like that that are single gene. Uh, disorders, really, in the pea plant. You know, if you're a pea plant, you're not supposed to have seeds that are wrinkled. They're supposed to be round and smooth. And those single gene effects are deterministic. They're hardwired. If you were a pea plant and you had that mutation, your seeds would be wrinkled. End of story. Now, with humans, we have thousands, some people say 7,000, single gene disorders. Huntington's disease is a disease that causes neural degeneration later in life. The famous uh, American folk singer Woody Guthrie had that. And so now his son, a famous folk singer, Arlo Guthrie, has a 50% chance of having that mutation. If you get that mutation, you will die from Huntington's. It's hardwired and deterministic. So that's where people Mm -hmm. get this notion of genetics equals fatalism. But the big difference is that for most complex disorders, medical, like heart disease and obesity and alcoholism, as well as psychological traits, are not influenced by one. It's not a major single gene effect. There's thousands of little genetic effects. And that creates a huge conceptual difference. We're not talking about higher hardwired deterministic disorders, but rather um, we call them polygenic. Multiple genes are involved, and that makes them probabilistic. probabilistic. We can talk about your increased risk for, say, schizophrenia or reading disability or, or personality traits or cognitive abilities, but it's not a single gene. And that's really hard for people to get their head around because, as you say, they want to think of things as black and white. You know, do I have the gene for this or do I not? And it's important to know there are these single gene disorders. Most of them are extremely rare. So if you go to one of these mm-hmm. direct-to-consumer <clears throat> um, DNA testing companies, they'll tell you about uh, the most common of these rare genetic disorders, and they can absolutely tell you if you have that gene. Most people end up being disappointed. They say, well, I didn't have any of those, so that was a waste of time. But actually, no, I'm, that's very good news that you don't have any of those. That's pretty and good they are deal, so that's, rare. Yeah. yeah, so rare that the chances are you don't have any of those. But that's because they are so rare. We're talking about the most common are one in 10,000, but most of them are one in hundreds of thousands, one in a million. You know, so they're very, very rare. But if you get them, they're deterministic and fatalistic and often very bad. You know, so that's why people have trouble getting their head around probabilistic genetic risk rather than hardwired single gene determinism. So deterministic is essentially equals outcome whilst probab- pro- pro- like the probability is more about just being on the spectrum of probability whether you will be affected by a given trait or not. Is that right? Not quite. Not quite. It's just it's um, even a single gene is probabilistic in the sense that most of them are recessive. It takes two copies of a gene. You, oh, I, I okay, imagine most yeah. listeners know about recessive and dominant genes. So Huntington's is a dominant mutation. You just get one copy from either your mother or your father, you've got Huntington's. But most single gene disorders are recessive. So they require a copy from both parents. Now, that mm-hmm. most of those mutations are tied up in what we call carriers, where you have one mutation, but you don't have the other. That is, you get one chromosome from your mother, one from your father. So you got one mutation, say, from your mother, but you didn't get it from your father. So you are what we call a carrier. So you're carrying that mutation, but you don't have the disorder because it takes two copies. However, if two carriers mate, then it's probabilistic in the sense that one quarter of their offspring 
will be affected. That is, that it's just simple probability. You know, you got 50 50 chance mm-hmm. of getting it from your mother, 50 50 chance of getting it from your father. So there's a 50 50 chance of you being a carrier. But what's the chances of you getting one from each parent? Well, it's 0. 0.5 times 0. 0.5, which is 0.25. That is, if you and your, your mate are both carriers, 25% of your offspring will have the disorder. And the, another 50% will be carriers. And the other 25% won't get either mutation. Now, that's critically mm-hmm. important because if everybody now, you know, in, I don't know, are you in, where, where do you live in Poland? Are, where I don't know, I'm where, actually in the UK, but I, I come from uh, Poland. Okay. Well, um, I know in the UK um, that if you're going to marry someone or in the States, you need to get certain tests done, primarily sexually transmitted diseases. Oh, but if instead, if you and your mate did this DNA testing, you could find out if you're both carriers for some rare single gene disorder. Now, individually, mm-hmm. there isn't much of a chance. The chance that you're both carriers for the same disorder are even rarer, but it might be as much as one out of 100. And if you then took that test, rather than waiting until you have a kid who has the disorder, which is the way the vast majority of people find out that they have a recessive disorder, instead of waiting and actually having a kid who's affected, if you knew you were carriers, then you could actually do something like in vitro fertilization to make sure that the embryo that you create does not have that mutation. So in one mm-hmm. generation, if everybody did this, you could eliminate these single gene disorders, which some people say are the major cause of uh, major medical problems in the world. You know, trillions of dollars yeah. are involved in that. So, and there's someone actually at Harvard Medical School who's offering to do this for people just because it would have such a huge impact. And it's already been done. I, I'm So, you know, a, a lot of what we talk about, people think, well, it's just sort of mildly interesting, you know, like what's your genetic risk for, say, schizophrenia um, or even dementia? There isn't anything you can do about it now. But, you know, it's part of understanding who we are. And I can talk about, well, would you want to know that you're at an 80 percent risk for having dementia later in life? We can talk mm-hmm. about that later. But I just wanted to say that with these single gene disorders, um, if if this guy at Harvard was able to convince people to do this, you know, we could eliminate these single gene disorders. And they've done it in New York, where the Ashkenazi Jews know that there's one type of recessive disorder, um, Tay-Sachs disease, which, you know, babies are born, they look OK, and then they just degenerate neurally over the first few years. It's a horrible disease always ending in death, you know, so it's really a terrible thing. And because the Ashkenazi Jews in New York are to have traditional assigned marriages, then they decided that they would actually do this DNA testing. And so in the last 20 years, mm-hmm. they've basically eliminated this mutation. So they don't have kids now who have Tay-Sachs disease. So it's a really good news story, you know, that there are certain things that you can really do something about. And it doesn't mean that you don't get married. It doesn't mean that you don't have kids. You can do in vitro fertilization. You might choose to adopt or, you know, depending on where you are in your mating, um, you could decide, well, there's many, there's a lot of other fish in the sea and you might just try again, you know. So you have a lot of options open <laughs> when you do this. There are yeah, but I suppose the like the... the 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 ethics of trying to think through these problems like it is it is complex because it's not like for example um IVF isn't without risks to for example the mother there could be arguments about the baby the cost blah 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 but the, on the other side of the scale there is immense suffering of individual suffering of the family watching their child go through this I think any degenerative disease that progresses slowly is difficult on a family that is witnessing Absolutely. that decline. Um, yeah. And then obviously there is just the economics of it and huge costs involved in 
supporting individuals to essentially what is going to be their death, their premature mm-hmm. death anyway. Um, yeah. And But on the other sort of scale of that argument, you do sort of start dipping into the eugenics. And I think in our culture in general, we tend to really shy away from any discussions that could be misconstrued as something that we've already decided is wrong. And we miss sometimes the sort of the middle ground where there is some real potential Mm. for real progress. Yeah. Well, it's a a great point. With some of these diseases, for example. Mm -hmm. Well, it's it's a great point that you raise. And it's always the case that with important new knowledge, there's costs and there's benefits. But I would like people to say uh, to I would like to reiterate what you said is there are there are ethical issues in doing something like in vitro fertilization, but there's also ethical issues of not doing something. You know, as you say, because yes. the cost to the individual and the parents are great as well as to society. So it's anyone who says, well, obviously this is what you need to do is wrong. But here's a case that might be particularly relevant for your listeners who, have I got it right, that they're, they're mostly women entrepreneurs? Is that who your audience is? Um, yeah, it's actually mixed. Um, on YouTube, it tends to be a little bit more predominantly men. Um, really? But the female listeners, yeah, t- YouTube is predominantly men, though. Um, no matter what so you show. Is that true pod- if you show cats? Yes. <laughs> it- um. <laughs> You're putting me on the spot. I'm I'm not an expert about <laughs> cat sort of videos, but I believe that YouTube skews male I and see. for example like TikTok or Instagram skews female. Hmm. Well, anyway, so though, for, for me it's about for your 60 female 40. entrepreneurs an important issue is uh, this is a concrete example of what you're talking about. Is for many years now, for decades, we've been able to diagnose Down syndrome, which is a trisomy of chromosome 21. It's mean instead of getting one chromosome from each parent, you get two from one parent. So you end up with three. And that's very bad. Um, However, it's a tiny chromosome. And the only reason it shows up is because it's less bad than all the other trisomies that happen, you know, where you get three chromosomes instead of two. Because it's so tiny, it doesn't have that much DNA. And it doesn't completely, most of the others, you don't even know you're pregnant. I mean, they're they're aborted spontaneously before you even know you're pregnant. But in the case of Downs, we can diagnose whether you have a trisomy 21 and many other chromosomal anomalies, as well as these single gene disorders. And, um, you know, it's strongly associated with older age, which is why I thought many of your entrepreneurial women, women that I know, often put off child rearing until later in life. And then they are at increased risk. I think in the UK, at 35, you're offered this test if you know if you're pregnant mm-hmm. at 35, something like that, and the risk goes up astronomically at 40, you know, for example. So it's something really to be concerned about because it's the most common cause of mental um, disability, and it's much more common in older women than in younger women. So if yeah. you're older and you're thinking of having kids. I don't know exactly what your chances are, but they're quite significant. They're they're not just 1%. They might be more like 10%. And mm-hmm. that's 10% of having a risk for a kid who's going to be, you know, there's, there's a range of outcomes. And uh, some parents decide they're going to go ahead and have their kid anyway. I have one of my PhD students who had made the decision to have a child, even though she knew it had downs. You know, she had gone through the in vitro fertilization, but decided she would have the kid anyway. But 99% Mm -hmm. of the women, I think in the Netherlands, it's close to 100%, decide not to have that embryo. Um, Yeah. You know, they, and then if they're in, in they, they can just, they don't need in vitro. They can test through a blood test, whether or not the fetus has that chromosomal anomaly. If in, in vitro fertilization, then you could actually say, well, you usually get 12, 8 or 12 sort of embryos because you want to see which one, you know, in vitro, you put a sperm and an egg together in a test tube and then you let it grow for a few cells 
called called an embryo rather mm-hmm. than a zygote. And you get a few of them. And it used to be you just see which one looks healthier, which one looks like it's ripe and ready to go. But now, if you have those, you could easily do DNA testing. And if you do DNA testing, yeah. say, for a single gene recessive disorder, which is probably the main reason genetically why people are doing in vitro fertilization, they know they've got this genetic risk in their family and they want to have a child without that risk. So you say, mm-hmm. okay, 12 embryos, uh, you'd, you'd expect that three of them would, would have a double dose, another uh, half would have one, but then a quarter of those, say f- uh, three of them, would have no, not, they would have none of those single gene dis- recessive dis- alleles, you know, the, the genes. So you could say, well, okay, I'll take that one. But then you still got three or say four or five embryos. And you can say, oh, well, mm-hmm. just pick by chance. But actually, once you've done the DNA testing, I could easily tell you about all these other single gene disorders. And if you, yeah. you can only put one in in the UK, so you have to choose. Not to choose is to choose, right? And then if I tell you, okay, well, of these remaining four, say, two of them have some pretty bad genes. I mean, you know, maybe they're not absolutely single gene disorders, but, you know, they're not cool. And these two don't have anything, you know, which would you rather put in? You know, so that's the way it goes. And it, it's a slippery slope, as you're implying. You know, it gets into designer babies then. What if I said, as some parents do who do this, I want a kid with a high IQ. You can yeah. do that. <laughs> and that scares people. But again, not to choose is to choose. So you can say, oh, I mm-hmm. don't know, just pick one at random and stick it in. Or you could say, well, if we're so, doing this, might as well do it all, do it the whole way. You know, I think the Catholic Church, I, I, being from Polish, I don't know how much the Catholic Church dominates what you, you're thinking. But, you know, I grew up in Chicago in a Catholic church and went to Catholic schools and that sort of thing. So I'm sort of, they tried to get me in the priesthood, actually. And so I, I'm kind <laughs> of imbued in that. And I do have to give it to the church that um, you just have to, it's a slippery slope. You. If you if you have artificial c- contraception, for example, you know mm-hmm. that's that's eugenics, right? You're deciding you're changing yeah. the results of uh, eggs and sperm coming together, and then you know if you get into in vitro fertilization or anything else you do reproductively, let alone abortion, you know it's all they they all kind of it's one thing leads to another in your thinking. Now, most people, even in Catholic countries, have accepted contraception. Many have accepted abortion. But, you know, as you say, these things are all difficult decisions, and you're balancing the right of an individual, of a child, but also of the parents, especially the mother, who has to spend nine months bringing this baby to life, as well as the society. Because, you know, if you have a child who's got a severe problem and has to be institutionalized, well, that's that's a cost for society. And, you know, I'm not saying any one of those is more important, but that's why the decision is difficult. You're balancing the rights of the kid, the parents and society. So difficult decisions. But I think it's important to have findings that make us think and that give us opportunities to make choices. And it's probably important to note that there is no like silver bullet solutions. You've got trade offs everywhere. So it's just mm-hmm. whatever trade-offs you're actually then willing to accept, for example, because <clears throat> wherever you go, for example, with like Down syndrome or with many of these solutions, there will be a trade-off somewhere. But if we can have a discussion whether that trade-off is worth is worth it or not. So and we essentially worth, started it it? initially. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. Go on. Go on. I just wrap it on a bit, so it's fine. Let's let's go ahead with what you were going to say. I can come back to any of these things. Um, well, I was going to start by saying that we started really on on a little bit more of these sort of single um, gene mutations that that result in um, difficult um, illnesses, diseases, disabilities. But then you obviously moved on to the intelligence, and that's more of the software feature. Um, So what do we know about um, 
heritability of these sort of traits and software features and mm. that, that affect our behavior more than, you know, our health as such. Right. Well, I wouldn't call them software. I mean, everything involves the brain and the brain involves neurons. So what your sight, your vision, there's individual differences mm -hmm. in how well people see and how well they lose their long distance vision when they're older or their reading ability. Those are individual differences. And it's a reasonable question to say, to what extent do genetic differences make a difference? And that's what we're doing with these, we call them quantitative genetic approaches like twins, comparing identical and non-identical twins or adoption studies, or now DNA studies where you actually find DNA differences that predict, say, differences in vision. Well, how, how different is that? I, I don't see it as a software hardware issue because vision is a very complex functional thing. It isn't just hardwired in the neurons. Similarly with uh, spatial ability or memory or verbal ability or intelligence as a whole. You know, we're talking about neural functioning of tens of thousands of genes affecting the billions of trillions of cells in our brain. It isn't like, you know, there's a, a, a direct line from your gene to your brain to your behavior. It, it's not like that. The single gene things come in in that so many of these networks are involved. But if you chop one of those, you can have a drastic effect. You know, it's like a car. If you mm -hmm. cut one of your spark plugs wires, the car won't run. But that doesn't mean that that spark plug makes your car run. It only runs in the context of all the other thousands of things that need to work right to make your car function, which I know because I drive these old beaters and you know there's an awful lot of things that can go wrong and make your car not work, you know? So it's, it is all complex in, in the sense that there are thousands of little genetic effects that are responsible for the strong heritability of all these traits. And, you know, cognitive traits are more heritable. You mentioned cancer at our very, very start. Cancer is one of the least heritable medical disorders, much less heritable than most behaviors. They involve DNA very okay. often, mutations in DNA, but they're not inherited. Another thing I, I can have personal experience with is I love the sun. As you can see, I'm on holiday, so I'm kind of sunburnt now. And if you get skin cancer, that you didn't inherit that. That's a mutation, say, in, in my hand here, you know, one cell got too much of the ultraviolet light or whatever, and it screwed up its duplication and made it go mad. You know, it, it just uses, it's mm -hmm. not like you're invaded with a virus. It uses your own reg, developmental regulatory mechanisms, and it disrupts them so that the cells start growing uncontrollably. That's basically what skin cancer is. But you didn't inherit that. That's an environmentally caused DNA mutation. You won't pass it on to your children. You don't pass on cells from okay, your hands. Okay, so, so you, you don't pass your you don't pass your genes, even though those genes have mutated. So do do you always pass the sort of the the blueprint that was there originally, not potentially the mutations that you've picked up throughout mm -hmm. your life? No, good question. You start life as a single cell. You know, with half the DNA from your mother, half from your father, that DNA, that same exact sequence of three billion base pairs of DNA, that's the steps, spirals, the steps in the spiral staircase of the double helix of DNA. So three billion steps. Those are the same sequences we'd find in the trillions of cells in your body. That includes your hand and your hair and your everything, brain, muscle. but all you pass on to your offspring are those cells that ended up in, as gametes, that is, eggs or sperm. Any mutation mm -hmm. there will get passed on to your offspring, but only ah. mutations there. Now, if you had a mutation you inherited from your mother, that would be there, right? Because, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's the same sequence of DNA that you started life with. But in addition, if you had any other mutations, uh, that you picked up that affected the DNA in your sperm or eggs, that you would pass on to your offspring. But 
a lot of the cancers are what we call spontaneous mutations in the sense that you don't inherit them. It's just that in the first few cell divisions, you might have a mistake. And that mistake is a mutation. It doesn't have to come from the outside. Mm -hmm. That is, if you're replicating 3 billion steps and nucleotide bases of DNA in every single cell, every time it replicates, there's a chance a mistake is made. Now, it's incredibly reliable, but when you're talking about trillions of cells, and these cells are duplicating themselves over and over again during your life, well, the chances are you will pick up mutations. And those are spontaneous in the sense that you didn't inherit them. They're de novo. And in most cases, then, you won't pass them on. They might just be in your brain or in your heart or elsewhere. They might just affect those other organs. They might not be in your testes or ovaries. Mm -hmm. okay, so it's an okay, important so, distinction. Yeah. Um, it, it, was, it was interesting for me in particular, in particular, because I did actually have cancer when I was younger. Um, I was diagnosed mm. at 26, and it, di it did cross my mind whether I would be potentially passing some, some you know, fractured DNA to my kids. Um, and at the time, there was no time to freeze my eggs or anything like that, so I didn't mm. know whether I would be able to have a family. I was very lucky that I could. So I've got a son and we've got another baby on the way. Oh, um, very good. But it, it, it was really interesting for me to even like consider that, like, would I be passing something? And on the other, mm. on the other sort of side of the same coin, I suppose, is, um, oh, what's the word that I'm looking for? The word that I'm looking for is, um, epigenetics so right. this is essentially the sort of the expressions of the genes so my understanding is that i for example could be carrying um the set of genes that would be predispo predisposing me to obesity but mm -hmm. if i work very hard eat very healthily blah 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 i will still be for example quite light and on the skinny side but the genes that I would be passing to my kids still would carry that higher probability of obesity happening. And obviously, it kind of depends on how they then gel with the genetic material from the other, the, the other parent, right? Right. So, so that's a very, mm -hmm, very the good epigenetics point, are also not heritable. Is that right? Well, that's really that's exactly right. And there was a thought that there are some examples. They talk about the Dutch famine, or there's some experiments in mice that suggest that you can inherit a little bit of the epigenetic marks they call them from your mother. But that's pretty much discounted now. And so, as a general statement, oh, okay. you don't inherit epigenetic differences. Epigenetics is just slow motion gene expression. So. Your genes, you know, people say you have 24,000 genes. It's hard to say what a gene is because it's all more complicated than the old classical model. But these genes aren't all going in all the cells. The cell, in fact, is probably only, there's only housekeeping genes in common. Most of the genes in your liver are expressing themselves differently. That is, different genes are being expressed in your liver because it has different functions than in your brain, say. and the point mm -hmm. is that DNA evolved to give you um, stability across generations. So your species evolved in a certain environment, and your genes have been adapted that way in the sense of natural selection. You know, genes that help you in that environment, they, kind of, they work, and those that don't. And so there's general species-wide effects of these genes. And you transmit those faithfully from generation to generation. But then RNA, that, that is, DNA is coded into RNA, which is another DNA-like sequence with a little bit of a difference. And that's what goes out of the nucleus of the cell. The DNA stays in the nucleus. The RNA goes out and then, and then codes for amino acids, which become proteins. It's everything that we are, neurotransmitters, bone, brain, everything are these proteins that are coded by 
DNA. But which ones are expressed is a matter of RNA telling the DNA, okay, we need some more of this, and they allow that bit to be transcribed and translated into protein. So that's RNA evolved to be responsive to the environment. DNA evolved to okay. say, this is what we need as human species, you know, we don't mess with this. But RNA then is, I think, it, you can think of it as being responsive to the environment. So you were talking about obesity. So it's your, uh, RNA will say, well, wait, now I, I need some more sugar here. And then it would code for uh, the proteins, enzymes that you need to metabolize sugar. And it, and it could well motivate those very deep animal bits of your brain that say, let's eat, you know, because back we evolved. Our, the problem with obesity is we evolved in a, in a stone age where um, we have stone age brains in a fast food world. Our brains evolved at a point when if you could get food, you would eat it because you didn't know when your next meal would come. You want you favor genes that store fat because for that same reason, you don't know when you're going to eat again. But nowadays, you know, in a fast food nation where you're bombarded by food cues all the time, it's actually a risk factor now, a disability for obesity uh -huh. that you're able to store fat very well. So anyway, the point you're making, I think, takes us back to the idea of fatalism. And you started by saying you could have the obesity genes, but you could control your environment, you know, so that you don't eat so much. And I have a high genetic propensity to obesity. And what I do is I change my environment. I just don't have junk food around, you know, and I, I, I just make it harder for myself to get fat, you know, because um, I know it's also harder for me to lose weight. So like if you were, for example, on like 98th percentile risk for obesity, for example, for being prone to obesity, how much can you still affect it? Like, can yeah. you still be a model size for? You could, or yes. will you never be able to sort of get it there? Will you always be struggling? So yes. to what degree that blueprint and sort of genetics, genetic, um, how prone you are to these conditions, to right. what degree so, does it actually decide your fate? Right. So again, that's fate, fatalism. And what we're saying is if it was a single gene, and there are some single gene causes of obesity, where if you have one of those okay. genes, they're extremely rare. And it's usually fatal early in life, but some children will just eat anything in sight, including poop. And, you know, they just, just eat anything. But that is not part of the picture here. We're talking about probabilistic propensities rather than predetermined programming. So the example is a good one. My highest risk factor on these DNA tests is for obesity. You said 96. I'm at the 95th percentile for obesity. And so, and in fact, then, uh, I'm actually only at the 70th percentile for body mass index. So I'm a lot less mm -hmm. than my genetic risk would suggest, but that's because I work at it. And people who say, if I knew I had a high genetic risk for obesity, I'd just say, oh, well, can't do anything about it. That's fatalism, though. You can do something about it. And in fact, I find for most of these genetic risk factors like alcoholism or even mental health, but especially obesity, it's motivating because I now know that other people, you know, I can, um, well, I just put on weight more easily. I could explain mechanisms for that than other people. Now, skinny people would say, mm -hmm. well, just get a grip, you know, pull up your socks, as they say in England, and just get some willpower. <laughs> but that's easy for skinny people to say. And for people with a genetic risk, that is, it's hard for me to resist food cues. Like I can't walk back past a bakery and smell fresh pastry and stuff without drooling, you know, it, it just it really appeals to me a lot. And the other side of it is satiety. Most normal people, when you're at, you go out at a restaurant with people and they say, I'm full, I can't eat anymore. They, if you tried to push food on them, they'd say, oh, no, I'm full. You'll make me sick if I eat anymore. Right. But I say, OK, mm -hmm. I'm full, too. But then before you know it, I've eaten everything on the table. You know, I just don't have that sense <laughs> of satiety. And I love food. So. It's, I've found, instead of it being fatalistic, for me, it's been very motivating. 
because I know I've got a lifelong battle of the bulge, you know, I've got to do something about this. And what do I do? Well, I can do something environmental, like change my environment. I just don't have junk food in the house because I know even if I have crisps lying in a cabinet, I say, OK, I, yeah, I don't need them. But, you know, late at night, you just say, oh, I'll just have one crisp. And then before you know it, the bag's gone. So I can change my environment. But now you can change your biology. That's what all this talk is about, about um, Ozempic and the semiglutides. I mean, they really do work. Uh. And I'm, I'm trying to do something with this company, one of the biggest companies that started. I've been using it for a year and a half now, and I've lost uh, 11 kilo and easily. You've been on Ozempic or on the other one? Ozempic. Okay. I was one of the early users. Wow. Of it. And I was trying to get the company to, say, to, to study this. I, my, my hunch is that people like me with a high genetic propensity will profit most from Ozempic. The problem they've got is that you've got your Hollywood A-listers who are skinny as rails anyway, who want to be skinnier. You know, they, So that might be problematic. But I really do think that people like me who you know, really have a biological propensity towards putting on weight and finding it difficult to lose weight, I think they profit especially from this biological boost. And, you know, mm -hmm. uh, with all the fat shaming around, people say, oh, well, that's sort of too easy. You lost all that weight and you didn't really have to suffer. Well, I'd say, you know, get a grip. I mean, that, that's a good thing. Because if we could lower the, the number of people with obesity, the advantages to the health service would be enormous. I mean, you know, this over, yeah. overweight obesity epidemic is costing so much money and loss of quality of life with diabetes, heart attacks, even cancers. Everything seems to be related to obesity because you're, you're overloading your body, you know? So uh, I'm just kind of a bit of a, a zealot about this right now, but yeah, a good example. It, it's, it's really interesting. I mean, I came up with, I came, I came up or I stumbled across Ozempic probably earlier this year. And I remember when I started looking into it, it does work, but it does, it, it works so well that you really need to be careful what you eat because you could get yourself into malnutrition simply because it, it hacks, amongst other things, it hacks your satiety system. So you will be eating less. And if you still, for example, eat junk, uh, you are going to be um, missing some, some much needed nutri nut like nutritional scores, for example. But I think just as we were actually talking about um, obesity, what we stumbled on is the genome-wide association studies and the polygenetic scores. So when you said yes. about your being sort of 95 percentile, am I right in saying that is your polygenetic score for obesity? Exactly right. Yes. So exactly do you right. want to just explain to the audience what that yeah. polygenetic score is? Yeah. Well, I, I started talking about the last um, 50 years of genetic research and psychology and then ended up by saying by the 1990s or so, most psychologists and most people began to accept this mountain of evidence for the importance of genetics. And just about that time, the DNA revolution came along. And what that means is that instead of using twins and adoptees to indirectly triangulate on genetic influence, you can actually pick, identify DNA differences that are responsible for heritability. And the strongest ones are for a, a height, which is about 90% heritable, but DNA alone can explain 50% of the variance. You could predict at birth, you could make a pretty good prediction about a kid's height. You could certainly say this kid is not going to be a basketball player, for example. Because, you know, they're going to be, you could say they'll definitely be uh, smaller than average, for example. And obesity mm -hmm. and body weight index is one of the next ones in terms of power of prediction. Now, psychological traits, though, it's interesting that despite most. So what this polygenic score is, is that 
we initially were looking for just a few genes and saying, say for depression, can you can you look at dopamine transporter, which the dopamine genes, which are involved in the therapies, the drug therapies for depression. They're called candidate genes because, you know, you just scratch your head and say, well, those genes ought to be important. Because back then, we could only genotype a few genes at a time. It was very expensive and slow. And then in the mid-2000s, say 20 years ago, something came along called a chip. It's called a SNP chip, which is a single nucleotide polymorphism. So that's one step in the spiral staircase of DNA. And that's what most DNA differences are about. There's every other sort, but 10, there's 10 million of these steps in the DNA sequence that differ between us. And I should say here mm -hmm. that 99.9% .9 of the 3 billion base pairs of DNA are the same for all of us. It's only this tiny fraction of the DNA that has these inherited differences that can make a difference in behavior. That's got to be where heritability is. But how do you find them? Mm -hmm. And so that's the SNP chip. It was, a discovery was made that you could, on something the size of a postage stamp, you could genotype hundreds of thousands, typically now 600,000 of these SNPs. And then you can say, and it's, it, it's very cheap now. It's um, maybe 50 bucks per chip. And you, once you genotype someone, you can, well, that's why these companies like 23andMe can do it for $100. They can do this for you. Mm -hmm. So they genotype you for these 600,000 SNPs and they say, okay, these 3,000 SNPs predict obesity. So what do we do? We put them together. We add them up. You know, each one has a tiny effect, but you can add up their tiny effects and end up with something that's quite strongly predictive. So that's called a poly mm -hmm. multiple genetic score. So it isn't just three or four of these SNPs. We're talking about thousands of these SNPs. But you just add them up until adding more SNPs doesn't add anything to the prediction in an independent sample. So this is a huge um, advance that is revolutionizing all of medical science, biological science. It's what medicine is largely about now, there's some huge studies being done so that you, um, well, there's so much to say about this, but basically, uh, if instead of waiting till someone has a heart attack, you can now predict mm -hmm. which people are likely to have a heart attack. And if you wait until they have a heart attack, in the NHS, it costs about half a million pounds to fix someone to the best you can. I mean, often it leaves damage and quality of life is less and all of that. Now, in contrast, that's half a million pounds for one person and you don't do any good for anyone else, right? I mean, you have to wait till the next one gets a heart attack. So instead yeah. now you could use DNA to predict who's going to have a heart attack and then you can intervene to prevent heart attacks. And you can do that at all sorts of levels like the simplest level is information. We all hear you're supposed to exercise, eat well, and sleep well. But, you know, yeah, so what? But if I told you you're at a tenfold greater risk for having a heart attack before you're 45, you pay attention to that. That's at the lowest level. Mm -hmm. It costs nothing other than information. But then there's a lot more you can do. There's these new body scans that can actually look to see whether your arteries are fuzzy. They can, pre they can predict physiologically how much more of a risk you are for heart attack. So instead of waiting until you have a heart attack, you could actually do even surgery at the end. But you could do a lot of, there's a lot of drugs that can alter some of these things, you know, that uh, like many people are taking uh, statins and blood pressure lowering medicine. So there's so much you mm -hmm. can do to prevent these disorders. And on every count, medically, economically, socially, and personally, it's just got to be so much better to predict and prevent disorders than it is to wait until you have them and try to fix them, and especially in psychiatry, because we're not very good. I mean, you know, we don't cure schizophrenia. You don't really cure alcoholism either or obesity. I mean, these are lifelong sort of problems, and you can ameliorate the symptoms. But, you know, most alcoholics, will, recovered alcoholics will tell you, I'm a recovered alcoholic. I'm an alcoholic, though. You know, and you basically stay away from booze. That's the best way to, to take care of that. Yeah.
So Mm -hmm. I think it's very exciting. And this is going to happen in medicine. It's happening already. You know, there's a, a project right now in the UK to get to do this genotyping on 5 million people. It's called Our Future Health. And the idea is to link it to medical records. And probably just they've done it already in Finland and Estonia for the last decade. But what will happen is you'll be told you're you're at high risk for, um, say, obesity or alcoholism. Sorry, my phone just went off. I thought I had turned that off. Um, So, you know, you'll probably only be told things that are actionable. But that could go down to Mm -hmm. psychological things. Like if you knew you were at high genetic risk for alcoholism or even your kids were at high risk, the first thing is we're not fatalistic. It doesn't mean you're going to become alcoholic, but it does mean, mm-hmm. um, say, if you do you have a son, they're particularly at risk for yeah. alcoholism. Yeah. If they go out and drink as much as their buddies in, in adolescence, uh, their buddies might be fine. But they, that might actually be a first step towards them becoming dependent on alcohol. So you could just say, just pay attention. It's, again, same message we all mm-hmm. get. Monitor your alcohol use. Take holidays from alcohol every now and then to see how dependent you are on it. Just use your head. And even at that simple level, then you could just say, okay, let's just pay more attention to it. Doesn't mean you're going to be alcoholic, but let's, why take a chance? You know, it's probably good for you not to get blotto with your friends anyway. So there's very little cost to this. And, you know, a lot of possible gain. I think that's really interesting because currently we do seem to have more reactive health system, which is amazing if you break your leg. But if you're struggling with obesity, the entire system isn't really geared up to be really helping you, like other than go and do some diet. So these polygenetic scores, I think initially they will be driven by people that want to take care of their health but at some point it would be really good to start to make a switch towards more preventative care which initially is going to be hugely expensive for example if NHS was to take on that project because you can't just then drop people that are already ill but you're already investing money into people that are not ill yet well, um, so I think see, that, I, that that period of transition is going to be perhaps a little bit prolonged just simply because mm. it might be driven by public initially instead of, for example, like the government yeah. giving people some funds to do this. I don't actually, actually know. Like, is there, a, is, there a, is there a country that is doing it already? I don't know about obesity per se, but Estonia and Finland, if you go in and you get blood taken to the hospital, they say, do you want your DNA testing done? So um, I don't know if they specifically tell them about things like obesity. But what I would like to disagree with, you said that it's going to be very costly. It's going to be so cheap. It could be saving the NHS. And here's how. You know, just really? suppose. Now, a lot of people are go going on. to be freak out by this. But what if we have this information. We already have it from UK Biobank. There's probably several million people in the UK who have this genetic information. And it's not the government, really. 27 million people in the world have paid about 150 bucks to have their genetic testing done, in part for ancestry. And it's very interesting. A lot of people don't really have the ancestors they think they do. Everyone in America thinks they're Irish, for example, and they're not. You know, so ancestry is interesting. <laughs> Finding out about these single gene disorders is great, but increasingly now finding out about these polygenic risk factors for complex disorders is where it's at, right? So people have paid to do it themselves. But what if now we have this project with 5 million people doing their DNA testing in the UK? This is happening. I mean, it's funded right now for uh, 180 million pounds as just starters. You know, so it's expensive to roll this out because they're rolling it out as an experiment. Mm -hmm. 180 million is a drop in the bucket in the NHS. You know, the overall bill is what, 30 billion, 35 billion, something like that. So once you do do this testing, that's it. You never have to do it again because you've got all the DNA information. And so if now just, they won't do it for this, but suppose you did it for obesity. 
and you say, take the people who are at the top 5% of risk for obesity, give them semiglutide if they want it. I think that would, you know, instead of doing, you know, at the extremes now, they do this very expensive uh, surgery where they, uh, what's it called, um, where you squeeze off some of the intestines so that people have trouble eating. You know, it's it's actually for uh, the, the, the gas, gastro something band. It, it, that's right, bands. That's right, gastro bands. And you know, that's pretty extreme doing surgery. In fact, doing surgery on very obese people is actually a bit um, dangerous as well. Even putting a general anesthetic on mm -hmm. someone is very so. That's really dangerous and you know intrusive, right? But what if instead? People will lose, there's enough studies now to say you'll lose about 10 to 15 percent of your body weight. That alone, you know, could just change everything in one year's time. And imagine the savings yeah. to the NHS on diabetes, heart disease, and cancer. So I don't think it is expensive. It's so cost effective that in med medical circles, it's considered a non brainer, no brainer that we really ought to be doing this genetic prediction because DNA is by far the best early warning system we have because it's there from the moment of conception. It doesn't change during your life. So we could predict very early on in life in order to prevent. And that's important because the best interventions take place early. The longer you wait, the more damage is built up and the harder it is to reverse that. So if we could predict very early on, which we can, you could make a huge difference. Okay, so we are essentially then assuming that people would um, start maybe taking a bit more initiatives over their own health with that information in mind, with a little bit of early support, for example, from the health center where whether it's in states or in the uk now we, when you were talking about 23 and me is it 23 and me mm -hmm. yes 23, 23 and, and me. me is that the company yes. yeah 23 chromosomes so do yeah so do they like test for all of it like polygenetic scores and like where you came from or do you have different companies that specialize in different tests so for example do, if you yes. wanted to look at a bit more mental health and health polygenetic score what are the reputable companies that are actually um out there that you know people could go in and, and get it checked right good question um 23andme is they can all do this genotyping very accurately because any monkey can do it. You know, it's just, it's so standardized now, the SNP chip thing. So the genotypes you get are accurate. And that means that the single gene information you get is quite accurate, because that is pretty easy to do statistically. But where it becomes more difficult is with polygenic scores and how they do it. And there are very few companies that do it well. 23andMe decided not to do it other than for BMI. Now, Obesity isn't a disorder. It's the extreme end of body mass index. There's nothing etiologically different about obesity. It's merely a cut point in the normal distribution of weight. Okay, so mm -hmm. uh, that's the only polygenic score you get, to my knowledge, from 23andMe. And there's historical reasons for why they're reluctant to get into polygenic scores. But what they let you do is download your genotypes, you know, your 600,000 genotypes. And there's many other companies a few dozen by last count, that will allow you to upload your genotypes and they give you polygenic scores. The problem is they're bad oh, genotype, okay. polygenic scores. They don't do it right, I, which is crazy. Why, why don't they do it right? Because it takes no more effort to do it right, but they don't. They just take a few genes and they say, oh, here's your polygenic score. The reason is they want to get your data. They want to get your genotypes because that's big data and that's a lot of what the intellectual property of these companies are. However, there is one company that started up in New York that looks very good, and they're called uh, Nucleus Genomics, Nucleus as in Nucleus of a Cell Genomics. Mm -hmm. And they um, don't just do SNP chips. They do whole genome sequencing. 
So that means you you actually determine the sequence of all three billion base pairs of DNA. So would you rather have three billion bits of information about your genotype or 600,000? Well, you know, it's a pretty easy question to answer. So they do the whole genotype, which means they can give you all those single gene mutations, but they're also committed to giving people polygenic scores. And it, it's, it, it's funny, last night they just had their launch of nucleus genomics intelligence. They're rolling out polygenic scores for intelligence to people who have joined their service. And they decided to do that to take the bull by the horns. You know, I mean, of all the traits you've talked about, obesity, you know, people wouldn't object to that, would they? Or reading disability. But, you know, the bet noir for a lot of people would be intelligence. But, you know, intelligence is one of the more highly yeah. heritable traits. So they decided to take the bull by the horn and say, it's your DNA. Why should we decide what information you should get? If you don't want that information, you don't have to look at it. And it's like dementia. We mentioned that at the beginning. Um, uh, mm -hmm. If I go to give a public, even for this audience, if we could take a poll of them now and said, we can tell you if you're at, um, we're all at about a 10, 15 percent risk of having Alzheimer's by the age of 80. But if you, I can tell you genetically if you'll be at a 60 or 70 percent risk. Now, it's still probabilistic. It doesn't mean you absolutely will have Alzheimer's, but as medical risks go, that's astronomical from 15% to say 60%. You know, that's a huge increase mm -hmm. in risk. So if, if we polled your audience, I guarantee what we'd get, because I've done this so many times, is that half of them would say, no way would I want to know. It would ruin my life. You know, every time I forget something, I'd say, oh my God, I'm getting Alzheimer's now. The other half, though, with me, with where I am, is to say, well, no, I mean, it, uh, knowledge is power. And I could have, you know, even though I can't cure it now, I mean, I'd be very, I'd be watching for things where people are intervening early. Because the problem with these disorders, schizophrenia, alcoholism, everything, once they, they're full blown, it's hard to do anything about it. The, the aim of all of this work is prevention. So there's a lot of work being done trying to predict and not prevent, but ameliorate the effects of dementia. It's said that we'll all be demented if we live old enough. I mean, it's just amazing the brain can keep mm -hmm. posting 50 years after reproduction, which is all natural selection cares about, is reproduction. So here, you know, this most yeah. complex organ in the whole universe is coasting along. It's amazing we can even talk by the age of 60 or think by the age of 70. <laughs> you know. It, great credit to natural selection and the the uh, uh, togetherness of this hugely complex organ, you know. So um, the fact that it goes wrong later on, you know, it shouldn't be surprising to people. But if we can delay that when it happens, we'll die before it happens. I mean, that's the general idea here. Mm -hmm. And what's more is I would say if I know I don't have that risk, there's one particular gene that if you have that uh, it's only like in 1% of the population, it's recessive. So you need two copies. So only 1% of the population has two copies. But if you have two copies, you go from like, uh, uh, well, if you have one copy, you don't have any in increased risk. If you have two copies, it's something like a fourfold greater risk of just that one gene. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't have that. But if I did, or if I had a high polygenic score for Alzheimer's, there are things you can do about it. You know, you can do something financially. You could assume that you're going to need more care later in life. Socially, you can just arrange your situation so that you'll be in a setting that could accommodate you with dementia. And third, and most important to me, if I knew I was at greatly elevated risk for dementia later in life, I'd do a lot more carpe diem. You know, I'd say, I'm not going to wait until I retire to take these trips or learn to play the piano and stuff. You know, I'm, I better do what I want to do now because I don't know if I'll be able to do it later. So that's not nothing, you know. So knowledge is power in a mm. way. But I can understand the people who are too I, nervous about it, you know, to say, I don't want to know. But that's not me. And I, it's not about half the population. I, they want to know. Yeah, I, f I think there is a certain amount of, you know, trepidation. Oh, what is it going to show? Am I go like... 
you know, I find it difficult to like eat well already. Am I really going to be able to change it if I, for example, know that I'm at risk of A, B and C? But I think unless you don't know, you don't really know how it will affect you or you might not know how it will affect you. I'm I'm really interested in, in doing that. Um, recently, we did the DNA methylation test for our little boy and we found that two of the processes that sort of go on for the DNA methylation don't work very efficiently for him. So he, for example, doesn't deal very well or he doesn't produce efficiently the antioxidants in his body. That's a that's a big problem. So we are now addressing it, obviously all privately because NHS just doesn't, doesn't do that. But we are looking at it now when he's not even free yet instead of waiting until he's 20 and like he's mm. got he's had these nutritional deficiencies for years and years and years yeah. so i'm definitely in the camp of i prefer to know because quite often there are simple things that we can do to address it and even if there isn't like a simple s- silver bullet that we can do something that will make it better at least we can prepare. And Mm -hmm. I'm definitely in the camp of the knowledge is power. So we are now going through this DNA revolution. What do you think it's coming in the next 10, 20 years? Right. Well, people talk a lot about gene editing. The first question I get it from a public audience is always about epigenetics is if you've forestalled that conversation by pointing out from the beginning that that's not inherited. You don't inherit those epigenetic differences. That has to do with gene expression. And it's a particular type of gene expression that's slow motion. It involves these marks that slow some genes down from being transcribed. And when you relieve that, it allows them to be expressed more freely. So, you know, it's all interesting. Everything between genes and behavior, behavior is very interesting, but you don't inherit those epigenetic uh, differences. And the second question I often get is about gene editing. You know, can you change these genes? And uh, people have maybe heard about the huge discoveries in the ability to change one little bit of DNA sequence. So there's a lot of work now on single gene disorders to see if you can just change the mutation in the individual. Now, the problem, though, is that um, some things like cystic fibrosis involves the lung. So you could put in good genes in the lung because you can access the lung. But what about most of the things in the brain? I mean, you can't really do much there. And there's trillions of cells. So it for polygenic traits, for single gene disorders, we have very few examples of successful use of gene editing. The first attempt was with cystic fibrosis and the child died from that. So these things are not, um, you know, they can have a lot of unintended consequences. So I wouldn't say never, but it doesn't interest me because if we're dealing with disorders that have thousands of genes, you're not going to edit thousands of genes. All you could do is edit the Mm -hmm. first zygote, you know, the first um, when you well one cell organism. You could change things there, but you can't mess around with it too much because it's in the very earliest stages of development. Far better is in vitro fertilization because that doesn't involve any Mm, surgical techniques of the embryo. And you can change, you can basically change thousands of genes, you know, for example, uh, by polygenic scores. So you could take an embryo that has, instead of a very high risk for obesity, you could take an embryo that has a very low risk for obesity. So that's where it's going to go. And the other thing is to move away from SNP chips with 600,000 DNA markers to whole genome sequencing. The cost, just a few years ago, it was $10,000. Now, then it went down to 2000 then 1000 And there are companies that can do it for less than $100. So it's getting down to the cost of a SNP chip. So would you rather have 600,000? gene markers in a SNP chip, or three billion base pairs. Your whole DNA, that's all there is. That's all she wrote for inheritance. So that's it's definitely going to go mm-hmm. to whole genome sequencing. 
And that creates issues, interesting issues for us as scientists, because that's an awful lot of information to try and uh, analyze. But that's sort of the fun part in a way. So it's been an okay. amazing advance in the last couple of decades, and I, I think it's it's not at its end by any means, and its applications are just beginning. Mm. What what a field as well to get into. Like you said, you know, it's changed so much since you started your career. Yeah. So um, what is it that you're working on now, and where can people find you to follow your work? Right. Well, my book Blueprint is a good starter, you know, for an overview. The reason I wrote that book is I wanted to make this revolution kind of um, uh, available to people because, you know, some people have knee-jerk reactions to this stuff, but it's much better to understand the basis for this excitement um, of the DNA revolution. And so that's a good place to start, but um, I have dozens of podcasts. Um, and you just look, if you just do Robert Plowman on Google, You'll get hundreds of entries, and and that will include my URL for my university, which has all my publications and my CV. So I don't hide it all. Just you know, because I don't do social media, so I don't care what people say on Twitter, for example. So um, I'm easy to find, and there's lots about me and my work, just easily available. And I, I'd recommend looking at the King's College London website, which is my main URL. And my Wikipedia entry has a lot of this stuff, too. So very easy to find out more about me and my work. Okay, lovely. I think I think pe the reason why people have got that sort of knee-jerk knee -jerk reaction sometimes to, to just how much genes can decide for us is that it puts us in it puts a question mark over our personal achievement over our agency over life and i the idea of like do we actually have free will or the fact that i'm hard working is just because i've got genes for it like mm. it's nothing that i've actually done it's almost like we are then it, i think it's that, it's that sort of discomfort around questioning our agency over our own lives i suppose um, absolutely maybe I think that, maybe yeah, that's it, why but well to some extent yeah i think that's right now when it comes to um say you having schizophrenia or depression you're less willing to take agency over that and you probably blame your environment for it but i think it's important to know say you have a genetic propensity towards anxiety and depression so what do you do about that you just say you could say oh i'm just an anxious person no you probably say I got to be a little more careful than other people. I maybe don't take these risks or whatever, you know, psychological risks. Or I, I hang out with people who are supportive or, you know, there are things you can do. But it's just knowing yourself, really, to know you have a genetic propensity towards anxiety. Again, not fatalistic. Doesn't mean you have to be anxious and depressed. But you can understand yourself a bit better and understand why do you get depressed more than your friends, even though your life is every bit as good as their life? You know, so I think that's one level in which it is very important. And it takes away agency to some extent, but it's not fatalistic. It helps you understand why you're more likely to have these problems than someone else. But where this really comes home is with your children. You know, the seven uh -huh. pages in my book, Blueprint, about parenting has has had more media attention than the rest of the book put together because basically I'm saying, well, what are the implications of this for your children? And the answer is, just as you say, you have less control agency over your children than you think you do. That is in terms of how they turn out as individuals. So you have a lot. Parents yeah. are important. You have a lot to do about their making them happy in daily life. But if you think that you your children turn out the way you make them, mold them, you're in for a world of hurt because you don't have much impact at all on how they turn out, whether they have schizophrenia, how good they do at school. Well, yeah, everyone recognizes height, you don't have much control. People don't quite recognize you don't have much control over their weight, how much they weigh. You have an impact on their day-to-day -day life. You can make their lives terrible, or you can make their lives nice. And you do things for them to help them be happy. That is not to make them what you want them to be. But part of the job, I think, of a parent is to recognize kids are different. And you want to find out what your kid likes to do and what they're good at and help them do what they want to do. So I think the role of a parent is to kind of step back and relax 
and watch your children become who they are rather than thinking you're going to make them what you want them to be. It's such an important issue. Mm -hmm. So you don't have control over the genetics. They are what they are. And that means siblings are 50% similar genetically. You know, your two kids about to be, but they're 50% different. And what you'll see as a parent is just how different they are from the word go. You know, the, the average IQ difference between two people in the population is 17 IQ points. The average IQ between two siblings on average is 13 IQ points. There's a very big difference. That's the difference between going to university or not, basically. So you got to recognize that your kids are different and help them become who they are. So it's um, you don't have much control genetically. And the thing we don't have time to get into is you don't have much control environmentally either because the environment is not nurture. It isn't the systematic effects of family environment. You know, Freud was wrong when he thought all psychopathology has to do with the way your mother treated you in the first few years of life. There's absolutely no evidence for that. The risk of schizophrenia is just as great if you were adopted away at birth and raised with different parents. Identical twins who are genetically identical, wow. reared apart in different families, their risk for these things is just the same. It's, it doesn't matter where you grow up. So what I'm saying, the bottom line for all of this in the first half of my book, Blueprint, is to say, if you had been mixed up at the maternity room when you, in, in the hospital when you were born and the wrong parents took you home, what I'm saying is you would be much the same person you are right now because the nature That's... accounts for half of it and nurture doesn't account for much. The environment is important, but it's not the systematic effects of family environment, whatever they are. They're making two kids in the same family as different from kids in different families. So there's a lot here, I know, but I, it, my book goes through it in a lot more detail. That That is, I think unbelievable because we can all point to many you know adverse childhood experiences that we've had whether it was divorce or some sort of traumatic experience or moving a lot you know whatever it was we probably naturally put quite a lot of weight to those events and how they then came to shape us so yeah. removing yourself from the idea that actually when you're an adult, what you are is largely what you were supposed to be. It is a mind shift that you kind of have to make. But yeah, Can I, I could say talk something? to you about I, I, it for the next six well, hours. Just, okay, well, let me just say one more thing on. about that, you know, is that that's the problem with environmental explanations. They explain anything. And that's not good. That's bad. So, for example, you'll, you'll find, I don't know about, you have one child now and one on the way, right? And um, Shyness yeah, yeah, I'm is, six is, is and one of the more pregnant. Um, one of the most heritable personality characteristics is shyness in infancy. You know, some kids are just very shy. Someone comes to the door, they okay. hide behind their mother. On average, there's an age where kids become shy. But the big individual differences in how shy kids are. Well, you have your first child, and let's say he's shy. And... If he is, you ask the parent, why, is your, why do you think your kid's shy? They give you one of two answers. Always, because I took him out too much when he was young or because I didn't take him out enough when he was young. That's the problem with the environment. Then you have a second child, and because it's genetic, they're 50% different genetically. Chances are they'll be different in shyness. And then you'll say, I didn't do that. And so that's why it's said parents are environmentalists until they have more than one child. And then they see these differences from early in life that they know they didn't create. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. As you say, lots more to talk uh, about. Like I said, there is, there is so much in there. So, guys, if you want to actually delve into this, you, you have to start with Blueprint, get through the book, read it, like digested, and find Robert for, for more of his work. So um, am, I, am I right that you're writing a new book now? I was, but I'm not. I was given a big contract to do okay. a follow-up on parenting. You know, sort of those issues I was just talking to you about a few minutes ago. But in the end, mm -hmm. I decided it, it's not my thing. You know, to write for parents, you have to write at a very low level. And, and I can't do it. But I wish someone would because there's, you know, the thousands of books on parenting. I don't know if you've done that. On average, parents buy almost two books on parenting. You go to that part of the bookshop, there'll be 
shelves full of parenting advice. They give you such diametrically different information. Dr. So-and-so says do this. Yeah. And uh, Dr. You know, X and X said don't do that, whatever you do. So it's, it's a terrible um, area. And it's not based on research. There's very little solid research that allows you to say, parents, you should do this or not that. In fact, uh, there's a great book called Crib Sheet by um, a former editor of, of the journal Economist who became pregnant and decided to look at the real evidence. And she ended up concluding that despite all this stuff out there, scaring parents about do X, don't do Y, do Y, don't do X, she says the only solid piece of advice you can give parents is, vaccinate your kids. Beyond that, your kid doesn't sleep well or does sleep well. It's partly because they're not recognizing individual differences. You know, it's different strokes for different folks. Mm -hmm. And parents, because they're genetically related to, related to the kid, are more likely to kind of get it right. But also, it doesn't matter if they get it right or wrong. It doesn't make much of a difference in the long yeah. run anyway. So you might as well just enjoy it because it is very enjoyable having kids unless you know, as you, you scare p parents to death about one false move and your kid's going to be screwed up for life. That's how these they make money on these parenting things or these articles in newspapers that are forever scaring parents about, oh, scientists have discovered you must do this if you want your child to be happy. But, you know, parents should just recognize they don't make much of a difference in the long run. So in, relax, enjoy this longest relationship you'll have in life because it's lovely. Do things yeah. for them because you love them, and that, not because you're trying to make them be what you want them to be. And that is actually quite an empowering message, I think, despite sort of potential um, downsides of just how much genes are responsible for, um, for how we turn out. So, mm. Robert, thank you so much. You've been so generous with your time. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Robert Plumbing. Very nice talking to you. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to Wisdom Rebellion. Before you go, if you enjoy the conversation, please consider subscribing. It massively helps with keeping the show on the road so we can all build a wiser world together. And if you loved this video, you will also love this one. I'll see you there.